Test one, two. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's that time again for our strategy session. So we're going to bring in our team of traders. And as usual, we're going to start off with Brett Manning. We're going to start off with a little bit of a macro approach as we usually do. So I'm going to welcome in Brett, aka Chart Trader. How are you, sir? I'm doing pretty good, Jim. How are you? I'm doing all right. Glad to get everyone together and we can talk about what we're going to see. Now, it may be a little difficult to assess everything that we would want to because we're on the horizon of earnings. And with that said, that will shift the focus of some of the strategy that we will have later on in the month. So we'll have uh, a really good one set up for August because we'll be We'll have that in the rear view mirror. So with all that said, Brett, I don't want to steer you too much here, but I do want to get your sense about what's driving things right now across the major markets. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm going to start off with, so as you know, probably uh, Donald Rumsfeld just passed away and he used to talk about known knowns, known unknowns, unknown knowns, and unknown unknowns. It was kind of his shtick, right? So I'm going to add to his list here by saying that the current context, in my opinion, is probably most sharply defined by, and again, adding to his list, by known unknown unknowns. So basically, we, I mean, there's a ton of big themes in terms of tapering risk, uh, inflation potential, peak growth potential, and lots of specific ideas. But I would say the main dynamic, and I think even in a very practical sense, the main dynamic that's shaping things is a really, really vast and, and clear awareness of how little historical data we have, how little comparison we have for the current context that we're going through right now. We've never reopened a globalized economy after a devastating global pandemic recession where cultural and economic life moved into a digital virtual universe and thrived for a year in a completely different state. We've never had anything like that, not even close. So there's a lot of things that are that are popping up that we, we don't really understand because we've never seen them before. Economists have never seen them before. Policymakers have never seen them before, and we don't really know how long they'll be around, how much of a problem they signal. Um, there's a lot of debate about the current nature of inflation that we're seeing right now. There's people on both sides, really smart people on both sides. Um, is it going to metastasize into something um, that's a big inflationary problem, or is it going to be really transitory? Or, or either way, is monetary policy something that can address the type of inflation that we're seeing. Um, the labor market supply shortage comes in as sort of a different oddity. It's kind of wrapped into, into that debate, but we don't really understand why it's happening. We have theories, but those theories could be wrong. I think people are armed right now with the sense that everything they think could be wrong, and it's a strange dynamic. Um, and, and a lot of these things have enormous consequences for whatever your approach is to the market right now. Um, and there's sentiment levels that, that I've talked about recently. There's leverage levels that are apparent from, from derivative markets dynamics um, that, that suggest that there's a lot of complacency even with that. But those two things add up to uh, a growing – and, and you, there's data behind this – a growing relationship between uh, – inverse relationship between volatility and market liquidity. So in other words, as volatility goes up, liquidity dries up. And that's something that we've seen in the past. Um, but it's usually in these sorts of moments where there is there's there's a really people have a really difficult time finding deep conviction. There's momentum movement forward. There's momentum movement back. But when volatility starts to spike, liquidity in the market dries up, and that's something that's normally associated with this. I would say this big sense of of vague, you know, uh, uh, known unknown unknowns. Just the awareness of a, a massive piece of the the map that's this blurred out in the fog of war because we don't have anything 
we can really compare this period to. So it's really difficult for, for people to find uh, um, that level of conviction, especially in the pullback. So I would say, as kind of an overarching idea, strategize for the best, but be prepared for the worst. And we're coming into a period that I started talking about as far back as March, that I think is, is a time when these sorts of dynamics have the risk of coming to a head. And that is basically when you get past there being any really big positive headline flow that is related to the vaccine-induced herd immunity-induced reopening dynamic and all of its great pent-up demand dynamics. Those are There's a lot of really positive news that we've been plowing through over the last few months that are really related to this kind of recent inflection, this 2021 inflection out of this terrible, dark 2020 pandemic dynamic and into this new policy, liquidity, fiscal driven, pent up demand driven explosion of reopening that's such to the benefit of the economy and lots of different individual players. And there's a, a kind of seeing around that corner and pricing that in dynamic that's happened. And I think we we pass out of that phase pretty much on Thursday, July 29th. And that's when we get Amazon's earnings. And that's when we've already had Netflix, Microsoft, NVIDIA, Apple, Facebook, Google, and then we get Amazon. And then we're done with really the, the biggest and best mega cap growth stocks in the market. Um, and in terms of their the greatest comp quarter, year over year comp quarter, probably in market history, Q2 of this year versus Q2 of last year. Q2 of last year was the, the negative 38% annualized GDP quarter. And this quarter is the big explosion of pent up demand fueled by all this liquidity. So it's kind of the most extraordinary comparison. And when we get past the best companies making the most extraordinary comparison, then we're looking forward to Jackson Hole about a month later, August 26th to the 28th, when I think we're going to start to get some concrete plan for tapering and we're going to start to get sequential comps that become much more difficult going forward from there. So I think that that's when you kind of get past this peak great headline flow and you get into staring down some difficult stuff. And that's also a period of time in August where you have liquidity problems in the market anyways. So I think the possibility – I think people need to be prepared or positioned for the possibility that we could see some real volatility emerge again um, ahead of Jackson Hole when you're kind of taking this momentum trade off the table that's related to this big kind of boom of headline flow. Um, and I think that I think that that's that's when there's vulnerability sitting there. Uh, as far as the Fed is concerned, inside of that, you know, we've seen the what I call the magnificent seven dots come into 2022, which really is just pricing in what was already there in terms of the euro dollar forward curve in the euro dollar futures market where it was it's been saying for months now that the first hike would happen it at or before december 2022 despite the fed saying it was going to be 2024 so that was already there a little bit in the market but i, I think the fed stocks are starting to migrate that way a little bit of market volatility a little bit of rate volatility that kind of pulled back a bit but it's back there now um, so I think that's where we're going to see things coalesce around. And I think the Fed policy is going to be moving in that direction. And it's important to remember in all of this what the Fed's goal really is here. And that is to create conditions where they can finally get off the zero lower bound on a structural basis. So they're willing to risk a little bit of inflation in the process. But, you know, I think a lot of things are going to come down to to some some dynamics that we don't really understand yet. But I think the Fed's going to coalesce around that. And I think we're going to start to hear a plan that's consistent with that in August at Jackson Hole. And I think that market expectations are going to set up for that, too, which means we start to get some concrete tapering starting at the end of this year. All right. So what I'm hearing from you is perhaps – you know, stay the course, but begin to hedge, and that hedging positioning should be ahead of the Jackson Hole event. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I think once you're past again, so I think once you're once you're through, let's say July, um, then you're entering what I think is really should be seen as sort of a new chapter, where you're really past all of the the super positive headline flow that people have been 
been kind of buying the rumors on all the way through. And we get to a period where we start to take a little bit of the other side of the story. And I think that you'd see if you, especially with the illiquidity that that's typical in August, I think that's when you at least have a higher risk for some sort of self-reinforcing feedback to the downside in the market. All right. So I'm going to ask you a question. It's a little bit of a tough question putting you on the spot. And I actually think that any one of you guys can answer this one. But Brett, I want to ask you in your heart of hearts, are you buying what the Fed is selling here about inflation and the story about it being transitory? So I think that anybody who thinks that they have the answer to that question is kidding themselves. I think that it's still indeterminate. It's not baked in one way or the other. And it will have to do with how certain issues play out over the next, let's say, six months. And really what that comes down. So it's like the depth versus duration thing that we talked about last year. How quickly is a vaccine going to be developed? How long are we going to be in this sort of shutdown space in the economy? If it's long enough, I talked about policymakers trying to build a bridge across a, an infinitely deep ravine. It doesn't matter how bad the data is in Q2 or Q3 of 2020, because we're going to be able to build a bridge across that as long as a vaccine comes before too much longer. But if the vaccine takes two or three years to develop, then we face catastrophic economic consequences. And so as it turned out, it was probably the best case scenario where the vaccine was concerned. So we didn't face that. Now we're facing a different thing where depth versus duration is the issue. But it's about when are we going to be able to reconstruct supply chains where variable cost equations for distributing things allows for the costs involved of just managing a globalized economy to come back down? And also, when are we going to see the the, the service side uh, labor supply move back to anything like where it was? And I think those issues are probably the main issues when, when you start to be able to do real world business again in a way that's not overly expensive. And also, when are we going to stop seeing these sort of these sort of simultaneous uh, pent up demand dynamics where suddenly on the same weekend, everybody wants a new whatever. And the supply chains just can't handle that because it's something that people weren't doing for a long time. And it just happens to be that everybody wants it at once and it completely overwhelms any notion of supply and you get a strange spike in prices around some event like that. We've seen a number of them. How, like, When is that dynamic going to start to recede? I think all of these things, if that's a year before all of these dynamics start to go away, then it's very possible that this metastasizes into expectations and that causes a problem. And then the Fed needs to remove liquidity to try to snuff out that problem and we're right back in recession. So that's a possible future. But if we start to iron out some of these supply chain issues and labor shortage issues, and we stop seeing these strange dynamics and pent-up demand kind of simultaneously coalescing around a single marketplace, if we start to see those things go away in the next couple of months, two, three, four, five months, then I think it's very possible that the Fed's right. And I don't know the answer to which one of those two scenarios plays out. All right. Well, that was a very diplomatic approach. I appreciate that, Brett. Um, I do want to bring in Event Trader into this discussion because I think what you just posted, Gavin, was somewhat relevant to what Brett was talking about as far as the uh, transportation index. Just anecdotally, I was at the pet store just the other day, uh, PetSmart, and I was looking for some some things and ended up coming to a he happened to be the store manager and said, "Hey, you know, I I'm I'm looking for some things I can't find them." He's like, "Oh, you're not going to find them anywhere. Uh we have about 100 million dollars of backlog uh, uh uh inventory stuck in China. So, same reason you can't find food food bowls, you can't find this, you can't find that." So, I suspect that that's a uh, a pretty big problem elsewhere in the world other than just the pet supply store, Gavin. So with that said, why don't you break down your cash transportation index that you just posted? Because I think it's relevant to the conversation. Uh, yes. Yeah. So uh, for people wondering what this is, this is a monthly report. I've been posting it for the uh, last six, seven months with our IYT position, just kind of tracking things. And it's pretty helpful for watching the economy. What it does is it measures changes in the North American freight activity and costs based on about $26 billion in paid freight expenses 
from the cast customer base of over a hundred of, of hundreds of large shippers. So it's a uh, think of it as the PMI for the transportation index. It's pretty help, handy to keep an eye out on. And really, what Brett was just talking about just continues to get uh, highlighted in these reports. Now, uh, one of the things that I did find interesting was we saw a deceleration in overall volume. And that's going to be something to keep a close eye on because, you know, we saw that 10 year come crashing in. And one of the reasons given was, now there's a number of variables here, but one of the reasons that was given was worries about a peak selling uh, or peak economic recovery. We talked about it earlier with China today and people are keeping a close eye here uh, in the U.S. on that. And, uh, you know, what they were pointing out in terms of that volume issue was a lot of it was to do with supply constraints. And this is something that we've been addressing for the last few months. And where you, you need to be careful on this issue is if you start seeing demand uh, drop off. You're, you're seeing in the housing industry right now where obviously I'm in the midst of going through a housing sale and uh, my uh, – Realtor was telling me the market has just dried up the last couple of weeks because sellers kind of get tired of chasing after these high prices, keep getting outbid for the different areas. So that's always the worry about when you see supply constraints, the whip effect, as it's called, where demand just dies off because people get tired of waiting on things. And and that's always the biggest um the biz biggest risk. So what we want to be doing is watching for any commentary on these conference calls to see if we're seeing any signs of that. Now, I don't expect that's the case, but when you're looking at a market that is more or less priced to perfection, and I know there, there's a ton of liquidity out there, you, you know, people are always just looking for any cracks in the foundation that could cause a little bit of profit taking or a little bit of a pullback. So I think for, for me, that's going to be one of the key areas that we're watching going into the Q2 earnings season in this cast index, as you can see from the bullet points, um, you know, the freight that they're able to charge remains firmly in their uh, favor. We, we saw the Biden administration with the executive order, but it wasn't nearly as encumbersome as people feared because it's not really going after the uh, so much the rates that they're able to charge. It is looking to open up competition to hopefully uh, bring some of these rates back in. But for now, they're basically able to name their price. Uh, we talked about the deceleration of volume, but it appears that a lot of that is coming from the, from the side of um, – that supply constraints, which hopefully should be passing. And then you got the expenditures, which is also accelerating. As you can see, it grew at the fastest pace ever in June, up 56.4% year over year. So, you know, keeping an eye out on that and how it impacts margins, but also would, um, you know, be a benefit for, say, Greenbrier, GBX, or some of the uh, trucking on. Uh, names out there like a Cummins CMI or something. So these are a few of the things that were pointed out in the transportation index that bears watching going into this Q2 earnings season. We obviously have banks kicking off this week in earnest. Uh, so watching to see what kind of loan demand is out there for overall economic uh, strength, taking a pulse on that. We know that the trading revenues are going to be down a little bit from Q1. I'm not overly concerned about that. The Q1 numbers were just simply unsustainable. But uh, one of the things that we do want to watch is the net interest income and net interest margins. And if banks start seeing a little bit of an impact from the recent pullback in rates, and if that gets them a little bit more cautious. So for me, coming into our earnings season, I think the number one risk that we uh, need to keep an eye out on is I think earnings are going to be great. We're looking at about 64% year-over-year growth in the S&P earnings expectations. However, if we start seeing a little bit more caution around guidance, then that could be a headwind that starts creeping in. And as Brett was just talking about, that could potentially be a headwind with the uh, with the 
with the aspects of tapering coming. So th there's some of the things that you want to, that you want to continue to monitor. The amount of liquidity out there doesn't suggest that there's going to be some trap door fall down through, but uh, there could, there could be some interesting aspects of earnings this time around that we want to see how it plays into the psyche of market uh, investors. All right, Gavin. Now, Let's exclude the hottest names out there, Apple, Amazon. We know that those are going to be big earnings events. So outside of that and the transportation sector, what is another sector that you really want to keep an eye on as a key read through for the back half of the year? Uh, I, I mean, they're all going to have their separate um impact on the markets i would think you know obviously semiconductors with the supply chain shortage and we want to continue to monitor them numbers have been good so far we had micron we had smart global so they remain encouraging and remember this is where they should start seeing a lot of strong demand getting ramped up for the holiday season that's going to be another big uh aspect of this how, how is those supply constraints going to impact the holiday spending so um you know semiconductors with the electronic components obviously will be a key read for not just the consumers but the but all the uh, other verticals that it works into such as autos and things of that nature uh, you want to keep an eye out on the basic materials to see if they continue to see demand from the industrials. That's obviously an inflationary point that we're keeping a close eye on with uh, the metals futures and everything playing a factor. And so, uh, you know, really it's a domino effect across the board that bears watching. I suppose you could kind of knock off oil as its own separate entity there based around oil prices and how that's trading. Certainly you got the energy demand aspect for running a lot of the industrial components but i'd be you know materials metals and mining and semiconductors i would say would be three key reads for how the economy is uh, progressing and how we're going to get in towards the back end of the year when uh, we start getting into holiday seasons yeah, semis is probably the one that I would rank the highest to get the commentary from. So, yeah, I'm definitely with you on that one. Hey, Greg, Trend Tracker, I want to invite you into the conversation and I guess propose the same question to you. Is there one sector in particular or maybe a couple sectors in particular that you really want to see? You kind of are diverse in some of your holdings. So I'd love to get your take on what you're going to be looking at. Um. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Jim. Um, I, I am trying to transition more of a focus towards consumer. Um, that's something that I, I probably should have done nearly a year ago, late last summer, last fall, when these reopening plays really had a big rally. And, you know, the reopening plays are kind of stalling out a bit. Um, but there are a lot of consumer cyclical stocks that are doing really well and actually pretty cheap. Um, and, and I guess it's just the market's, um, market's perception that, you know, this period that we're in right now is as good as it gets. But um, <clears throat> the consumer seems to be really strong um, in pretty much every metric. So I would think that um, I would think that the strong results do have some legs. You know, we look at um, stocks like um, the RV stocks or the boating stocks, even apparel retailers, um, they're all trading, they're all relatively cheap stocks. Um, they're all posting really strong numbers. Now, you know, it, it, there's a, the different sectors can obviously play out differently. So if you look at um, the apparel retailers, so, something that I've basically avoided for many years now, but, um, the pandemic kind of changed the dynamic, kind of flipped everything upside down over the last year or so. Um, if you look at stocks like ANF, Abercrombie, AEO, American Eagle, I wrote up um, I wrote up a positive piece on the Gap GPS on Friday morning, and uh, the, the whole sector kind of gapped up because of strong results from Levi's that day on Friday. Um, I, but in, in Gap, we actually have a catalyst because um, because of their partnership with Kanye West. Um, so 
So in, in any case, like that, there's a specific one that I kind of like there. But a lot of those charts are strong and the stocks are cheap. Now, you could make the case that um, this is going to be the best year for apparel retailers and it might be the best year ever or, you know, they, this might be this. It's pretty reasonable to, to assume that this is going to be the best year they'll have for a while. It might be more of a peak. So maybe you don't really want to, maybe you need to be careful. But, um, you know, if you look at the RV stocks, they're just like killing it. So, it, you know, they're facing really tough comparisons going forward. And, um, you know, it's kind of similar to the housing story, right? You know, it's got, it's been really, really strong. And how long is that going to last? As Gavin just noted, you know, it was kind of due to cool off a little bit. But longer term, if the, uh, the story remains intact, then at some point these stocks are all buys, right? So, um, you know, I'm obviously going to be focusing on the technology sector, um, tech, media, consumer. Um, there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on right now, obviously, during these still unprecedented times, as Brett noted. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunities out there from the bottom up. All right, so you highlighted Gap. Um, you know, one of the sectors that Gavin and I were watching pretty closely was that RV space, and you had mentioned it. And it seems like what's been happening is they have great numbers, and then the stock reaction isn't what you would expect it. Maybe sell the news. So, do you think that mm -hmm. it's an opportune time to dabble back in those names? Um, you know, I, I, um, I don't really have a strong opinion on like Thor THO is like the big one, right? Um, mm -hmm. Winnebago is the smaller one. It, these stocks are interesting. I mean, you know, they, they kind of, it is kind of a similar story to the, the home builders, right? They've been killing it, um, coming out of the pandemic and, um, yeah, I guess the investor concern is that this is as good as it gets and they're going to have tough, cop tough cops going forward, but you know, if if you do think that um, the consumer is going to remain strong, which which all evidence points to that being the case, then these stocks that are trading at you know ten times earnings or even less than ten times EBITDA, you would think they are kind of attractive. Now, uh, you know, I really don't have a strong opinion on Thor, THO specifically, but you know, it, it is you know testing the two hundred day here. It has an attractive valuation. Maybe it's maybe it's worth playing the bounce. Um, I, I was in. Um, I, I had owned Thor or Winnebago. I can't remember which one. I think I've traded them a few years ago, but you know, it, it is the RV space is kind of similar to housing, where that it was on fire coming into the pandemic, and um, then it was even more on fire coming out of the pandemic. So I can see how there's concerns that. Um, demand will start to fall off, but um, yeah, I, I, I don't really have a strong opinion on it here. All right. And I think there's like a three to five year cycle as far as uh, when consumers replenish these things. So yeah, maybe we have kind of hit that peak and uh, maybe it'll be another couple of years before they really catch fire again. But just based on what you were saying, as far as valuations, I thought, eh, maybe it might be worth uh, checking these ones out because they do seem to be strong. And the commentary from their calls have been that there doesn't look like there's going to be any, any weaker demand in the, in the not too distant future anyway. So just wanted to get your thoughts. Anything else you got up your sleeve there? Um, well, you know, I'll, I have a lot of positions out there. Um, you know, I've been talking about upstart a lot, um, as, and this, uh, lockup related sell off here, it's still, you know, like 30% off the highs. Um, I've been writing up that one almost every day. Um, I, I like NVAX, um, Novavax, which, um, has a catalyst here, hopefully in the next month or two with its vaccine approval and hopefully production ramp. Um, Axome AXSM is another one with an, uh, a catalyst here. Uh, next month, they should get their depression, depression drug approved. Um, um, Lyft, I think, should have another strong quarter here. And if the labor headwind goes away and the um, concerns about 
regulatory action on gig economy workers is is noise, which I think it might be, then uh, Lyft is looking strong here. You know, I'm in a lot of other reopens like Disney, um, Eventbrite, Expedia, Penn Gaming. Um, so, you know, I, I do have some exposure to the to the uh, consumer side here. Um, I agree with Scalp Trader that there is a ton of opportunity in SPACs. So, I mean, I'm sure I will be um, getting involved in more of those. Um, all the recent SPAC deals that have, all the deals that have been announced um, over in the in recent months, they're pretty much all just sitting at 10 bucks. Um, mostly because they're all brought to market at pretty rich evaluations. So, um, you know, there's definitely going to be some, some div divergence there. The good ones will probably rise at some point. So, um, yeah, I'm kind of just trying to stay the course and focus on the sectors that I usually do. Um, but, um, yeah. All right. Well, Scalp, this gives us an opportunity to bring you in because we've been talking about SPACs for several months now, and they've seen their ups, they've seen their downs, and I noticed that you had focused on the space space, so the space SPACs. Uh, how's that for tongue twisters? Uh, I wanted you to give us uh, your, your read through on that. You know, we had a big event with the uh, Virgin Galactic launching their uh, first, I guess, was that a commercial crew that went into uh, space? And you know, I even watched it on YouTube and thought it was, eh, it was pretty interesting. If I ever, you know, maybe I can do a GoFundMe and uh, maybe y'all can get me into space if I do that. Anyway, uh, you had some commentary about what you thought might be the best play out there, and there's a spec. So why don't you talk about that, and then we can break down that space a little further. Hey, Jim. Uh, yeah, so I mentioned Rocket Labs, uh, VACQ, VACQ, I think is the ticker. Uh, let me pull it up to confirm that. I'm just looking at my yeah, VACQ. Uh, you know, I've mentioned that m multiple times. We got into it a couple weeks ago. Uh, it is a SPAC that hasn't closed the merger yet. And I think that's been limiting the upside. Um, I'm not sure if it's due to hedging. Uh, a lot of times you see a lot of serious institutional hedging of deals before the deal actually closes. That kind of holds the stock back. Uh, but as you as you saw with ASTR Astra, uh, pretty much as soon as the deal closed, the stock took off. It started to creep up ahead, about a week or a few days ahead of the deal closing. Then it basically ran from the 1080 area up to about 1550 or 16 within like a week. Uh, I, I like VACQ more than I like uh, Astra. So, you know, again, with SPACs, uh, it, you know, requires patience as, as I've kind of been preaching uh, the past several months. Um, you know, a lot of these names, there was a lot of trash that came to the market and you just basically just had to sift through it. And I think there are two opportunities with SPACs now. You know, Find the quality names that are done at a reasonable valuation close to the $10 par value between 10 and 11. And fortunately, none of the deals are really moving. So pretty much anything that gets announced stays below 11. So there's an opportunity to pretty much buy any SPAC that you want. But the other part of the equation, and this is something I've talked about a number of times, is the busted SPAC trade. And by me, what I mean by that is a SPAC that breaks, closes the deal, breaks the $10 par price and drifts down to six or seven bucks. And uh, we recently entered uh, Talk, T-A-L-K, as a prime example of that. And that is Talk Space. Uh, I think this is one that could definitely double or triple from here. And so the, the ability to buy it, I think with our last entry was in the low sixes. Um, to buy it at that level is really intriguing. I think there are going to be a lot more opportunities in the SPAC space to buy, especially when you get the next market pullback. You'll see some of these SPACs trade to four or five bucks uh, that will eventually double or triple or quadruple. So that's, I, you know, I, I look at, um, I love the stressed and relative value, and there's just not a whole lot 
out there. Everything's run up. There's a lot of very expensive, rich assets out there. And I think the SPAC space actually offers uh, one of the more attractive risk reward scenarios, especially once you get the next pullback, because you'll see money fleeing these names, they'll get hammered. Uh, you'll be able to pick some of these things up just at really, really cheap prices. And then say once they get a positive earnings report out there, something to ignite the name, you can see it double pretty quickly. So that's uh, an area that I continue to monitor closely. Uh, I look at every deal that, that hits. I mean, most of the deals still are not that attractive. So I have like just a, a list, a very tight, like focus list that, that I'm continuing to following very closely. And so I keep you on top of those. But you know, for the most part, I'm just kind of riding the current portfolio, uh, waiting for pullback opportunities to add to positions. And I really like to see some type of shakeout. I mean, I still think that, um, you know, there's kind of a rosy uh, scenario out there, and uh, I, I, just, I just don't think there's been enough pain in this uh, in this round of uh, stock market growth. I just think uh, there's just got to be more pain. There's got to be more pain. It's just like uh, never have a chance for everyone to make this type of money and be able to keep it. Like it just doesn't seem to work that way. So. Uh, I'm being relatively conservative and while understanding that, again, like you can make your year in a month, right? So you don't have to chase things and feel uh, a sense of FOMO because maybe the market's ticking up and you're not participating. Um, you know, things can turn pretty quickly and uh, that uptick in volatility can essentially make your year. So. That's uh, I'm trying to practice patience. And I've learned over the years that the hard part isn't making money. That is it's actually not even close to being the hard part. The hard part is keeping the money that you made right, and recognizing the shift and tone of the market and uh, being able to take a step back and wait for new setups to occur rather than just continuing to chase, chase, chase because the market's open and not recognizing that the speed has changed and that you need to uh, possibly take a step back and wait for more compelling opportunities. Hey, Damon, um, I, got, I got a question for you in terms of distressed plays here. Uh, one of the areas, there's a Forbes article out or a Barron's article out over the weekend talking about uh, the Chinese ADRs and under the pressure that they've been under, obviously, with the Communist Party doing their crackdowns. You got any interest in that space? Are you, are you uh, sniffing around there? You know, I, I'm willing to trade those names. And, you know, as we kind of get further along, maybe take a, a closer look. Um, but, yeah, you know, I, I've seen the Chinese stocks go out of favor for years at a time and valuations really contract. Um, so I kind of look at when I look at Chinese names, I'm looking more at the relative value trade, like wait for the coast to clear and maybe have a couple of names that you really like and buy those once the leading names start to run. So I, I'm not I have not been a huge fan of, of Chinese names long term, like I'm more of a swing trader or short term trader in them. Um, so I, I don't I don't really like the idea of kind of being the first in the water on those. All right. So I guess that does explain why you've been somewhat quiet from the trading perspective, Damon. Now, I've heard Brett say that, you know, you should be prepared for the worst and maybe some volatility may emerge after July. And you are expecting some type of a pullback at some point. Now, timing it is always difficult. However, I don't hear anyone really suggesting any shorts or positioning that way outside of hedging. Is that, uh, is that the way to look at it? And are you asking me specifically, Jeff? Yeah, you. for Yeah, we can start with you and anybody okay. else wants to chime in. Yeah, I mean, I, my general approach, and you know, this is from years of trading, is that I just make more money on the long side. Uh, trying to time shorts, well, I will hedge when I'm carrying uh, a large book. Right now, I have a relatively large cash, cash position, 
Um, but if if I'm heavily weighted in equities and feel like, hey, we're getting a pullback, but we have another leg higher, I will then look to hedge those positions. But if I'm already sitting, you know, fairly heavily in cash, um, then I don't, I don't see the need to hedge. Then on the short side, the idea of trying to make 10 or 15% is just not that compelling to me. Like my, my approach and I, I kind of do better and I just like the idea of this and I think I have more success with this is let the market pull back, have those, that list of compelling names that you want to own that you think can double, triple, quadruple and scale into those as the market's pulling back. So instead of me focusing attention on trying to identify compelling short setups, I can have complete attention on doing the research on names that are dropping that I want to own. And so that when the time is right, I am completely prepared and comfortable to begin scaling into those names for the double or triple versus trying to catch a 10 or 15 or 20% pullback. And, and, then, and the other thing about the 10 or 15, 20% is that, right, when you're short a stock, you're just not going to be as comfortable putting as much size on, right? Like, I mean, so I don't know, say whatever the number is, you know, whether it's five figures, six figures, like you don't want to be short of stock and have that thing rip on you, like open up because they are being acquired or they get some type of momentum short squeeze that launches this thing 50%, 100% over a few days or a few weeks. Um, however, when you are, and you know, those losses can be unlimited, obviously. However, when you're buying something that you believe in that has long-term upside, you feel more comfortable putting on greater size. So I think your participation and ultimate reward is, is much higher than when trying to short. And as you can see from, uh, was it Melvin Capital this year? I mean, <laughs> you can get your, get your head absolutely handed to you trying to short stuff like GameStop or some of these high volatility names and almost, you know, I mean, they essentially had to get billed out, right? Like, um, yeah, I, I, I don't ever want that, that, that to be me. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I guess I guess it would be nice to have a, uh, somebody to bail you out. Uh, I guess if that's the case, uh, you can do whatever you want. Um, all right. So, well, and, and Jim, let me add one thing though. I mean, one thing that I think that I mean you can do is you know you can implement some option strategies, perhaps. Um, you know, if you, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I you know if you have. Positions that you want to own, you know, possibly sell some covered costs, generate some additional income. Um, but yeah, I, I'm just, I'm not, I, I have shorted over the years and I've looked at my track record and all my different accounts, and shorting is, is my least profitable strategy. All right. Well, and part of the reason why I wanted to get that out in the open is because when we do see a pullback, the majority of feedback is, hey, how come no one was shorting today? Well, it's not that easy, right? And it's not as profitable as being patient as, you know, picking your spots and finding them. Um, so I think when the time comes, if there's good shorts out there, we'll be able to find them. Uh, Blue Chip is always good about finding those so it's charred in the future so you know be patient don't 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 stress it if you miss the first day of a of a sell-off because if it is a true bear market they last more than a day and you'll have plenty of opportunity all right so before we move away from earnings uh why don't craig why don't you jump in and just talk about a, a few things that you have sure um you know i just wanted to to throw out some of the Q2 earnings stats. <clears throat> it's, this is just data from FactSet. Um, this is, if you Google earn, uh, FactSet Earnings Insight, this is all just on their website. You can kind of pull this, but um, you know the market is kind of just in this slowly breaking out mode, kind of going off what Brett is saying. Uh, we all know that this is gonna be like a record Q2 earnings season, right? Uh, we have the, the easy compares from the trough of the pandemic last year. So the numbers are just gonna look fantastic. Um, 
Q2 earnings right now, or I guess this was as of uh, Friday uh, last week. Q2 earnings expected to grow 64%, um, which would be the highest rate since 4Q09, coming out of the financial crisis. Uh, revenue up 20%, which would be the highest since 2008. And that's when FactSet started tracking that data. So I'm not sure how far back that would go, but probably quite a ways back. 20% is a lot for, you know, that. This is all data on the S&P 500. Um, and the growth is obviously being led by the cyclical sectors that were negative or zero um, last year when their businesses were basically shut down uh, or there was no demand. Um, you know, so based on the recent trends, um, we're expecting 64% EPS growth. It's probably going to come in the 70 to 80% range. Um, it's historically the beats were like maybe three to 5%, but over recent quarters, the beats have been more significant. Um, positive pre-announcements uh, for earnings are at the highest level since, again, the facts that started tracking this stuff in 2006. Um, so, um, you know, the, the S&P is trading at just over 21 times forward earnings as compared to 18 times the five-year average and 16 times the 10-year average. The market um, is not cheap, but it reflects the strength um, that we are seeing and, you know, so it comes back to whether or not these strong results are discounted. Um, as Brett mentioned, you know, there's a, especially if we aren't rallying in the coming weeks on these strong earnings reports, um, you know, it's, it's important to keep in mind that the sell sign estimates are kind of a low bar and everybody expects them to get beat. So companies have to beat that whisper number, the buy side expectation. Um, but in any case, you know, if, if we can't rally on these blowout reports that we're seeing, then maybe that opens the door for, well, you know, either to sell the news or maybe we're, we're due for a pullback there. Um, but um, maybe that just sets up another buying opportunity. Um, you know, I don't often have a strong opinion on the broader market. I just kind of focus on the bottoms up and find stocks that I like. But um, that's a, at least a little primer heading into the reporting season. All right. So I want to bring in Blue Chip. Are you with me, my friend? I think so. Can you All right, me? good. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to make sure you were you were around. Um, so your strategy doesn't change very much, be it earnings season or not earnings season. So mm -hmm. I wanted to at least get your take on a couple of names that you put on today. Uh, one being Disney, and well, we'll start with that one. Uh, th they're names that you are in and out of a lot. So Disney and Broadcom. Let's start with Disney. Sure. So uh, again, I'm more of a, a shorter term swing trader. I'm just looking to, you know, take money out of the market on a day to day, week by week basis. Um, you know, so that basically keeps me very technically oriented and not so much macro, economic, uh, fundamental oriented. You know, more that's more strategic. I am a little bit more tactical on a shorter term basis. Um, so with that said, you know, Disney uh, had some headlines. You know, I think Black Widow came out this weekend, had some pretty good numbers uh, over the course, you know, comparative to what it's been showing over the last year. The parks are reopening, et cetera, et cetera. And it's been on my radar, obviously, you know, it's a major component of the major indices. It's been underperforming the last four months since it peaked out last March. It's been struggling below the 50-day moving average for the last quarter. And on these headlines today, it managed to actually break above those four-month downtrend lines, above weekly resistance, back above the 50-day moving average. And it's holding on to those gains there with, a, with some pretty strong thrusting action over uh, that 180 level. So... From a swing trading perspective, you know this is a changing of uh, potential shift in this underperformance, and you're starting to see money rotate back into that group. And that's the key thing here, I think, is um, you know you mentioned how come nobody's really fading this market or getting short this market. I think we're just kind of maintaining the status quo right now. Everything's still in an uptrend, and when you're still in an uptrend. It's just really difficult, even when you see overbought signals and sentiment might be too high or too bearish or RSI indicators might be, you know, at the highest levels they've been, et cetera, et cetera. It's probably prudent to take the foot off the accelerator a little bit and not get caught chasing extended upside moves. But to, like you said earlier, to be just kind of moving all into cash and then heavily shorting the market is going to be just a really difficult thing to do without the market actually dictating that it's you know going to actually drop and correct like that. So 
in my experience, when you're maintaining that status quo in context of a bullish market, usually what's happening is there's a lot of rotation going on between the uh, underlying industries and sectors. And I think that's been a really prevalent theme that we've seen here throughout the last few months. Um, whether it's from growth into value, value into growth, out of discretionary, out of housing, into solar, into semiconductors, into retail. I mean, it's been all over the map and it's just about tracking those uh, rotations on a week by week basis to kind of capitalize on the momentum. And um, so that's basically what I see for Disney. I mean, and if you look at a weekly chart or the daily chart, it, it, it looks really nice. It's been out of favor for the last couple months and we're finally starting to see some money pour back into it. And I, I think it's just a nice uh, swing setup for everyone right there. Uh, you swing around to uh, Broadcom, uh, AVGO. This one's been on my radar. Gavin and I have talked about it pretty much every every month. We've mentioned how it's one of the top semiconductors, but yet it doesn't really seem to do a whole lot. It's been stuck in a trading range for the most part of this year. Um, if you look at the action from June, that was very tight consolidative action. It held the 50 day moving average as support around 460 on multiple occasions. It yet at the same time, it could not get over the 480 resistance level. So it basically created a very sideways range throughout the entire month of June. As July got underway, I think Gavin and I also mentioned it maybe once or twice over the last week or two, uh, just to keep it on our radar as a potential breakout play over 478, 480 area. I got my alert today when it jumped up again above that 481 area, kind of waited for the opening pullback to see what was going to happen there. And then sure enough, uh, some rumors came out. I don't know if it's a hundred percent true or not, but I think it, but they did say that there was potential that they were going to buy out SAS Institute. So uh, that got the stock. I obviously uh, increased volatility. A lot more eyeballs are on it right now. So, it kind of missed the ideal entry point because of the volatility and the spikes. So you have to adjust your share size. But overall, the technicals on a weekly time frame, on a daily time frame, they look pretty solid. I do like the stock above this breakout above 480. Um, and I usually don't surround myself around these sort of events, but I'm letting the tech, hopefully the technicals supersede the, um, the rumors that are flying around there. So those are the two trades that I'm involved in right now. All right, and my last one for you, any sectors of particular interest that you want to look at for earnings season that you find maybe opportunistic? Um, you know, I'm going to trade everything pretty much, you know, as always, you know, anything significantly gapping and making a disruptive gap is always worthwhile. Um, you know, our financials are going to be in play, obviously, that this whole week. Um I, there's a few sectors that I found interesting here. One of them is this lithium sec sector. LIT is the ETF. Uh, another space that we've talked about for about two months now, uh, just kind of creeping up the right side of the chart there. Um, the, the two plays that are moving today, at least this, this, this a lot of the components here are uh, foreign uh, based. So the only two that I can spot that are probably uh, more um, – you know, U.S. based is Alba Marley, ALB. It has a really strong breakout today. It's up about $14 right now. But it's just got this beautiful chart where it too was also going sideways for the last six months and then just started to aggressively break out on volume. So I think that's worth a closer look. And then um, LTHM, which is a lithium play. Uh, that's Larry Tango. Henry, Michael, um, another one. It's been basically sideways for the last six months, and it's starting to perk up back above $20. Um, you know, part of the LIT ETF, which has been, you know, really kind of making its way to the upside there uh, on the lithium and battery side of things. So uh, another ETF, too, involved in this space is CARS which is the electronic vehicles and mobility ETF, which is obviously also involved in the lithium and battery side. So K-A-R-S, uh, we have that also moving to the upside. I like that one as well. Um, that's Those are really the main two that I'm looking at right now that are showing relative strength today. Uh, there's a couple other groups from medical equipment, real estate, pharmaceuticals. You know, they've all been performing pretty well that uh, I think you just have to kind of keep on your radar as leading groups to monitor. But rotation, bottom line is rotation is the main theme. It's summer doldrum trading. Everyone's going to be focused on earnings season over the next couple of weeks here for the opportunities based upon the volatility surrounding earnings season. And then like 
uh, going back to what Brett said earlier, once Amazon's done at the end of the month uh, reporting earnings, I think we're going to go into August where we're going to really hit that uh, uh, that summer doldrum, probably liquidity dry up phase. And, um, you know, the market might be a little bit more corrective uh, during that time frame. So as of right now, it's really just kind of just, you know, look for opportunities based upon increased volatility. Uh, but at the same time, don't overextend yourself. It is summer trading. Um, you know, keep things relatively light just to keep engaged, but don't force anything, especially after the first hour or two. All right. So we're going to shift gears and we're going to move over into oil. Now, Brett, I'm going to bring you back in, in, into the discussion here because you've been bullish oil. Now we've seen a pretty decent run, a little pullback today, but what do you make of the recent volatility and the issues over at OPEC? So yeah, I think uh, generally speaking, we are we're in the beginning period of a consolidation period of oil, but I don't think that it's something that represents a cyclical top. And I might sound a little confusing here, but here's the idea I'm trying to get across. I think that there's, I think we're heading into a period where people are going to find a lot of excuses to start speculating on the idea that we've reached a cyclical top in oil. I think the the um, and I think that this is going to set up a really, really important opportunity in oil and in oil stocks in, in the fall. Um, but I think the peak growth, peak policy theme that we're start, that's starting to come together right now across a lot of things, and you can see it in interest rates, and you can see it in headline flow, and the Fed taper messaging that's going to start to make it even easier for short side spec money to flow into oil futures. I think that that is really – it's going to be uh, something that, that – is, is seductive for market participants there. But I think that that whole perspective is based on a really flawed understanding about what's been driving this bull market oil in the first place, which is much more lined up around, and we've talked about this a lot, so it's, it's, it's a supply story. It's supply constraints and production capacity issues and the pace of production capacity capacity expansion and any kind of investments in new production capacity were way behind the curve and we're sitting way behind the curve and we are going to see deficits start happening we're going to see a deficit in august it's already it's already being forecast in other words where we're going to be using more oil than we are producing for the first time in a long time and we're not that's not causing any major uh, pickup in the pace of production um and and there's there's a policy, a production policy side story to this too, in terms of what OPEC is finally able to do again, because the U.S. Uh, production situation is is just still kind of in tatters, and we've seen we've seen power flow to the most conservative U.S. producers, and they're really not in this kind of on again off again ramp up suddenly as price goes above fifty four dollars or whatever. That situation has really been kind of dismantled in the United States, and it's possible that we don't really need OPEC plus anymore, but we still have it. And so that's more insurance. Um, so we've seen, a, we've seen a little bit of volatility emerge over the last couple of weeks in oil. And I want to put a couple different pieces of perspective on that. And, I, and, and again, why this really doesn't represent, I think, a major top, despite the peak policy, peak growth theme across the, the larger macro scene. So that happened right at the beginning of Q3. And this is the, the highest, so as far as the quarter opening price, for oil, uh, this is basically the highest price that we have seen on any kind of uh, uh, overarching view in in major oil markets since 2014. And what you get a lot of times as you shift to a new quarter is a lot of meetings at these companies, and 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 really it's about addressing a question, a couple of questions. But one of those questions is, can we use the futures market to? Do we need to? Is this an opportunity to do some serious balance sheet repair? Because they've got in-ground in -ground supply, and they can actually sell that forward instantly just by shorting futures. So they can go up the curve and start selling oil right now. And if you're if you, you're really going to pile that toward the front end of the curve now because of the backwardation that we have in the futures forward curve in oil, so you're going to end up seeing a lot of those guys if they make that decision. They're basically taking cash out at seventy dollars plus a barrel for the first time in a long time, and they can make a lot of headway with that. But it's all going to fall on the front end of the curve. And I think that's a lot of what we saw, despite the fact that it was kind of around this OPEC meeting. And the OPEC meeting might have had something. It was a botched OPEC meeting, and I think that. People see it as maybe a first shot across the bow of eventually OPEC plus breaking up and then even possibly OPEC breaking up, which I think is, is a valid thesis and a valid way to look at things, but over a larger time frame. I think it's, we're getting to the point 
in sort of the larger evolutionary history of the oil market where, you know, OPEC is going to no longer be necessary. And that's just based on a transition in energy infrastructure toward renewable energies over, you know, if you look at like the next 10 to 20 years. Um, but but I don't think that that's something we're really going to start seeing right now because there's so much they have to gain from staying together, especially when you don't have this counter influence. They push oil up above 70 bucks a barrel and you don't suddenly see the rig count double on a Friday. You know, the, the U.S. is not just switching everything back on. It's just it's 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 just not happening. Um, so I think U.S. companies are actually cashing in the futures market. And I think OPEC is perfectly happy to sit there and allow prices to float higher and not get aggressive. You got to remember um, oil, the 200 day moving average for WTI was over $90 a barrel for over three years in the early part of last decade. So this is, and OPEC was there every time it dipped down to 90, just holding it up and pushing it back up. That's a place they like to be if they're not scared of what's going to happen coming out of the U.S. So I think that we've got a situation where they're going to allow this thing to move higher. And I think a lot of people are going to get sucked in over the next month or two into this idea of a cyclical top in oil. And it's really going to set up a kind of uh, like a CFTC exposure picture, a commitment of traders picture where things are really neutral in exposure. And you still have all these forces and still have a lot of supply constraints. And I think you could really see oil take off again in the fall. And there's a, I mean, if you look at the stocks in the space are just not priced for that. So they really have been kind of lagging in terms of historical relationships with the price of oil. And if this reinforces itself and takes off again, I think there's a lot of ground to make up there. Oh, very fascinating. So, all right. So you still see continued upside in the forecast for oil, particularly in the fall. Yeah, I just don't think that what we've seen is a typical cycle. I think that there's a lot of strange things happening right now, and it has to do with the you know negative forty dollars a barrel on the other end of it last year in April, and what that did to to the U.S. Uh, production infrastructure. You know, the whole the whole setup here that was the counterbalance to what we're seeing in terms of managing a policy framework that can keep oil much higher. So that that impediment was taken away, and I think OPEC is in a position to be able to take advantage of that. All right. So I want to toss out, if is there anything else that I did not cover that you guys want to mention? I'll do a going once and a going twice. And no, I'm good over here, Jim. I would just state that I love the OIH as a second half play. And uh, just listen to Brett's commentary. That definitely has me thinking to double down on that. So that's the only thing that I'd add. All right. Well... We actually did get a lot of different ideas and perspectives. I didn't think we we're going to have a whole lot to talk about, but guess what? We went over an hour. There was plenty to talk about. So you guys, as always, thank you so much for bringing the new ideas and uh, ironing out some of the old ones that we had. I can't thank you guys enough for joining us today. Uh, that's the listeners and our team. And we'll do this all again next month. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Chip. Yeah.